independent investigative journalist and activist Mark Youngworth here. Recently I saw a link to an article on someone's Facebook page about the standoff in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. The article said that the standoff began early morning Sunday, March 20th, 2011, and lasted until about noon. When I saw the article, it was Sunday the 20th, a little after 2 p.m. I began reading all the articles I could find on the situation and found no answer as to how the incident started and why. With a six-hour standoff situation, especially when it has been over for a couple of hours, we should at least have the specific details as to how the incident began. But as you will learn, not only is the public being given too few details, some details have actually been changed and other pieces we are given simply make no sense. By about 3.45 p.m. that Sunday, I still couldn't find an article or news report with any real answers. Being a journalist who pays a lot of attention to the news, I know about how long it should take to have certain details on most situations. At that point, I was frustrated enough to make this Facebook post. This incident started at 6 a.m. It lasted almost six hours. Why don't we have any details yet as to how this thing started? I've read four articles and have not found one real explanation as to why this happened. How did it start? Who or what instigated it? For sure, not just some bullshit speculation about problems with his girlfriend. I want facts. The media is garbage. There were multiple witnesses and nobody has a report from any of them as to exactly what the order of events was. Tanya, if you ever find out about something like this while this is going on, call me. I don't care if it's 4 a.m. I'll at least make an attempt to get there and get some real journalism done because what the media is giving us is nonsense. Now we have to wait for the police to put together whatever version of events suits them best and deliver it to the lapdog media, and that's what everyone will quote-unquote know of the situation. I'm not saying there is anything nefarious going on here for sure, other than lack of journalism from the media, but usually when things like this happen, the police aren't giving any details as to how and why. There's usually something there that they don't want the public knowing. And I'd like to find out if that's the case here, and if so, what it is they don't want us knowing. But I knew they had a press conference scheduled for 4 p.m., so I figured I'd wait another 15 minutes and watch the press conference. Maybe they would give us the full story. After watching the press conference, I had no doubt in my mind that my suspicions were correct. There is definitely more going on with this issue than the police want the public to know, and the media is willing to assist in the cover-up. The question remains, what is it that they don't want us to know, and why? Before this video series is over, those questions will be answered. We'll begin at the beginning by going in order through articles from the Fond du Lac Reporter newspaper. It should have the most accurate details. It is the local paper, which means local journalists. Fond du Lac County has a population of about 43,000 people. In a place that small, everybody knows everybody. So why is there no news source with the real details about how and why? Rather than reading every story and repeating many things many times, I have went through each article making notes on what is relevant. I encourage you all to go through the articles as well. Let's begin and see what we can uncover. This article was posted March 20th, 2011 at 8.21 a.m. Headline, Fond du Lac police officer killed, second critically injured in shootout, suspect kills himself, suspect found dead in home. One Fond du Lac police department officer was shot and killed, another was shot and critically injured during an early morning shooting on the city's west side. Officer Craig Burkholz, 28, was shot and killed at the scene. He was shot in the upper chest, said police chief Tony Barthuli. Officer Ryan Williams is in critical condition at a hospital at Theta Clark Medical Center. Williams was shot twice in the chest, Barthuli said. If he had not been wearing his vest, he likely would have died as well. Deputy Chief Kevin Lemke said Williams underwent surgery and is expected to recover. Seven squads and two ambulances were fired upon at the scene by James Cruxon, 30, of 24 South Lincoln Ave, Lemke said. Cruxon died at the scene of a self-inflicted gunshot wound, said Lemke. He has many prior contacts with the police department. Cruxon was found dead in his home following a nearly six-hour standoff with police. The heavily armed man had apparently barricaded himself in his house after shooting the officers. Number one. Heavily armed? 
How many weapons did he have, and what were they? Police were called to the home on South Lincoln Avenue after 6 a.m., according to reports from the scene. Keep track of how many times this indescript term, reports from the scene, is used and what information it is used to deliver. In many cases regarding this incident, it seems to be used as a way to deliver information that is highly crucial without a valid source. Where does such information come from? Police were called to the home on South Lincoln Avenue after 6 a.m., according to reports from the scene. One neighbor tells the reporter he saw one of the police officers get shot. The officer was standing in the parking lot of the D&D Tavern when he was shot by a man aiming from a second-story window of the Lincoln Avenue house, the man said. Number two, specifically who saw this officer get shot? This person may be able to identify what officer it actually was that was hit while standing in the tavern parking lot. This will be very important later. Officers were called to the home on Lincoln just south of Division Street for a high-risk call, said Fond du Lac Police Department Captain Matt Miller. At a press conference at 11 a.m. today, Fond du Lac Police Chief Tony Barthuli issued the following statement. This is to confirm that a shooting has occurred in the city of Fond du Lac involving police officers. The situation has not yet been resolved. Please respect the privacy of our officers and their families during this critical time. We owe it to our team to do the right thing. We would also like to thank the community for their ongoing support. No further information is available at this time. Please limit your calls to emergencies only. We hope to have more information later today and will hold another press conference at 4 p.m. in the same location. Reports from the scene indicate at least one person was taken to an area hospital. Police have been at the suspect's home several times over the past year for domestic complaints, according to reports from the scene. Reports from the scene indicate the suspect had told people at a local tavern that he planned to start shooting people at 6 a.m. today. Number three, who said this? This is some pretty crucial information. Can we get a source? Several residents in the area said they are familiar with the man believed to be involved in the standoff. One man said the man frequents a tavern in the area and has been talking about shooting people because he was having trouble with his girlfriend. They tell the reporter the man had young children in the house. At 8.35 a.m., officers were evacuating people from homes around the suspect's house using armored vehicles and shields. Dale Pierce said he was on the phone outside his Forest Avenue house around 6 a.m. when he heard gunshots. It was a lot of gunshots, he said. Then I saw this woman and she was crying and saying they were shooting at her. The woman is the sister of Diane Allerman. Allerman, who lives in North Fond du Lac, said her sister was out walking early today when the gunfire started. She called me and was hysterical and said someone was shooting at her, Allerman said. It isn't clear if the shots had anything to do with the woman or if she was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Allerman said her sister called police and Allerman picked up her sister and took her to the police department. Marty Nice, who lives on Hickory Street, south of Division, said he heard about 6 a.m. what he th first thought were fireworks exploding. I thought, who would be setting off fireworks at this time of the morning, he said. Periodic gunfire could be heard in the area at least one and a half hours after the initial call. This article published March 20, 2011 at 8.34 p.m. Headline, Fond du Lac Police Officer Killed in the Line of Duty, Second Officer K-9 Also Shot. Key points here are, Officer Craig Burkholz, 28, was shot in the upper chest and died at the scene. Williams was shot once in the left shoulder and once in the right chest, just below the collarbone, according to Dr. Raymond Jorgen medical doctor of trauma at Theta Clark Medical Center in Nina. Jorgen said Williams sustained significant lung injuries but is responding to commands. Jorgen was optimistic about his prospects for recovery. Another officer was injured when he fell down a flight of stairs while responding to the call on Lincoln Avenue about 6.30 a.m. This was published at 8.34 p.m eight hours after the incident was over. Why do we know an officer fell down some stairs 
but not the details of exactly how and why the incident began in the first place. Fond du Lac Police Chief Tony Barthuli said Burkholtz and Williams were wearing bulletproof vests. If Williams hadn't been wearing a vest, I have no doubt he would have been killed as well, Barthuli said. Burkholtz was struck in the upper chest in a section not covered by his ballistic vest, he said. Wait a minute. An upper chest section not covered by his ballistic vest? Yeah, that sounded fishy to me too, so I looked up multiple ballistic vests by leading companies. Let's see what I found. As you can see by all of these pictures, I cannot find one single bulletproof vest that does not protect all of someone's upper chest. As a matter of fact, every picture of a bulletproof vest that I found clearly protects the upper chest. This would make it impossible for there to be an upper chest section of Officer Burkholz that was not covered by his bulletproof vest. What's going on here? Members of the Fond du Lac SWAT team found Cruxen dead inside his home shortly before noon. Deputy Chief Kevin Lemke said Cruxen died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Lemke said officers went to the home after a woman came to the police department to report a sexual assault involving Cruxen. This suggests the woman who made the sexual assault report did so and, in immediate response, police went to the residence. Note that it says the woman went to the police department to report it. Lemke noted that a main concern Sunday morning was checking the welfare of a six-year-old girl reported to be inside Cruxen's home. Officers located the uninjured girl at a nearby residence, he said. Officers also removed Cruxen's sister from the home while firing shots into the house. Note they are reporting that the girl in the house was Mr. Cruxen's sister. Keep track of how many articles we will go through without a single word about anything said or experienced by the supposed sister of Mr. Cruxen. Shouldn't her account of the situation be of paramount importance? The Wisconsin Department of Justice Division of Criminal Investigation has 22 agents investigating the shooting. Barthuli said heroes that emerged during the tragedy, like Schultz, will be recognized following a thorough investigation. With that many investigators, there should be no problem answering question 5. Why are there zero statements thus far for Mr. Cruxen's supposed sister? Burkholz, born in Kenosha and a graduate of UW Oshkosh, was a five-year Army veteran serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. He has spent about two years patrolling the streets of Fond du Lac. Barthuli called Burkholz a quality individual that stood for all the right things. Craig was an outstanding officer and a great person. We are going to miss him, he added. This will continue to be a running theme. The cops are painted as heroes, and Mr. Cruxen is painted as a volatile and psychotic person by the media, but not by those who knew him. Williams is married and the father of two children. He has been with the Fond du Lac Police Department for nine years. Here we find out that Officer Williams is married and has a child, and it is the same day of the incident. This will become very important later. Moving on. This article posted March 21st, 2011 at 3.57 a.m. Headline, Gunman Shoots Two Fond du Lac Policemen. Troubled Army Vet Kills One, Injures Another Officer. Important points. The gunman James M. Cruxen, 30, of 24 South Lincoln Ave, shot the officers as they responded to a call of gunshots fired in a Westside neighborhood early Sunday morning. 
first we were told that officers went to investigate because a woman went to the police station and reported a sexual assault. This makes it sound as if someone called the police because they heard gunshots. Which is it? Fond du Lac Police Chief Tony Barthuli said Burkholz and Williams were wearing bullet-resistant vests. If Williams hadn't been wearing a vest, I have no doubt he would have been killed as well, Barthuli said. Burkholz was struck in the upper chest in a section not covered by his ballistic vest, he said. Members of the Fond du Lac SWAT team found Cruxen dead inside his home shortly before noon. Deputy Chief Kevin Lemke said officers went to the home after a woman came to the police department to report a sexual assault involving Cruxen. Shortly after arrival, about 6.30 a.m., they, officers, were fired upon by a large caliber weapon, Lemke said. Lemke said a main concern Sunday morning was checking the welfare of a six-year-old girl reported to be inside Cruxen's home. Officers found the uninjured girl at a nearby residence, he said. Officers also removed Cruxen's sister from the home while firing shots into the house. The State Department of Justice's Division of Criminal Investigation is investigating the shooting. Barthuli said heroes who emerged during the tragedy, like Schultz, will be recognized following a thorough investigation. So here we see again mentioned the welfare of the six-year-old girl, the officers finding her uninjured at a nearby residence, the woman referred to as Cruxen's sister, um, they say that she was removed from the house again, and the cops, of course, the heroes. Barthuli said heroes who emerged during the tragedy, like Schultz, will be recognized following a thorough investigation. Barthuli called Burkholz a quality individual who stood for all the right things. Williams is married and the father of two children. He has been with the Fond du Lac Police Department for nine years. Next article, posted March 21, 2011, at 3.57 a.m. Headline, Fond du Lac Officer Killed, Two Injured in Shootings. And here we find no new information. However, further down the article, the suspect had told people at a local tavern that he planned to start shooting people at 6 a.m. Sunday, according to witnesses. Number six, who were these witnesses? This is important information. When a witness chooses to remain anonymous, the reporter usually notes that in the article. Why not here? Dale Pierce said he was on the phone outside his house near the scene at about 6 a.m. when he heard gunshots. We have Dale Pierce's name, who heard gunshots, but not the name of who claims Mr. Crux and said he was going to shoot people at 6 a.m. Why? It was a lot of gunshots, he said. Then I saw this woman, and she was crying and saying they were shooting at her. Periodic gunfire could be heard in the area at least 90 minutes after the initial call. Now we have something that's a little peculiar. This is a new headline, but read the body of the article. Does it look familiar? It should. It is the same text as the second article I covered. Take a look. See? Check the headline and then look at the look at that same body text and here's another one posted March 21st 2011 357 a.m. again different headline same exact body text this will happen numerous times they will slap a new headline on an article they already published and publish it as a new article or they'll take two-thirds of an article add a few lines put a new headline on it and publish that as a new article this is a tactic the media employs to make people frustrated and bored so they stop following that particular story. Next article, posted March 21, 2011 at 3.57 a.m., headline, Mother of James Cruxen, man who shot two Fond du Lac police officers, one fatally tried to talk him into surrendering. Important points of note. The 30-year-old Army veteran spent long hours trying to turn his house at 24 South Lincoln Ave into a home for himself and his live-in girlfriend and their two children from previous relationships. Uh, name? Can we get the name of his live-in girlfriend? Who is she? Despite his efforts, Cruxon's relationship with his 24-year-old girlfriend was one that friends and family described as volatile and toxic. 
The relationship brought police to the two-story home on Fond du Lac's west side on more than one occasion in the past year. Cruxon opened fire on police Sunday morning when they responded to his home for a sexual assault complaint. The shooting led to a six-hour standoff with police. Cruxon's mother, Lynn Sarita of Fond du Lac, was contacted by relatives early Sunday morning. Sarita, who had been vacationing in Arizona, contacted her son by cell phone while he was holed up inside his house during the standoff. He told me that he had just heard a police officer and that he could not come out of this. We begged him to put the gun down and go outside, said a tearful Sarita. The last time I spoke with him, he was unemotional, like he had given up all hope. Cruxon's best friend, Joel Foster, was also in constant contact Sunday with his childhood friend. We were trying to talk him into putting the gun down and coming out. I felt like we were doing a good job keeping him hanging in there until police cut off our phone contact with him, Foster said. What? Question number seven. Why would you cut off phone contact with Mr. Cruxon if his friends and family thought they were doing a good job trying to get him to hang in there and come out? Unless, of course, your goal isn't actually to get him out of the house alive. A friend had called and said they heard that Jimmy had walked out with police. We had hoped that we could just deal with what all had happened and that he had post-traumatic stress syndrome and was just in a mess, Sarita said. And then they called and told us he shot himself and was dead. <laughs> what? So a friend had called and said they heard that Jimmy had walked out with police and then all of a sudden they called and told us he shot himself and he was dead they I'm assuming being the police so did the friend that called uh, who supposedly heard that Jimmy walked out with police did somebody see Jimmy walk out with police how did this how did this information get out where did where did this come from while he was home caring for his nine-year-old son and his girlfriend's six-year-old daughter her son found out from friends that his girlfriend had been seeing another man, Sarita said. He always wanted everything to work out with a happy ending, and if it didn't, he didn't take that very well, Sarita said. The relationship wasn't healthy. Jimmy tried to make it good, but it just couldn't be good with her. In the four years that the couple was together, friends and family tried to intervene and convince Cruxon the relationship was unhealthy, his mother said. We kept telling him that she was no good for him, said a longtime family friend, Steve Andrews, but he just blew us off. I guess people have to learn the hard way. When he was awakened by the sound of gunfire outside his home around 6 a.m. Sunday, Andrews ran out on his porch. I ran out to see an officer crouch by his squad who yelled at me to get back inside, Andrews said. I had no idea it was Jimmy's house they were shooting at. Sarita said she was unsure of her son's frame of mind at the time of the shootings, she often wondered if he had reached a breaking point dealing with his grandfather's recent death, the effects of serving in combat overseas, and a failing relationship. He was such a loving person who wore his emotions on his sleeve and wanted everything to be perfect in life, but life isn't perfect, Sarita said. Honest to God, we did everything we could to get him to leave that relationship. Foster said his friend wasn't the same when he returned from Iraq. He was different after that, Foster said. Sarita said her son was a hard worker and would help anyone out in a pinch. Most of all, he was a good father to his nine-year-old son who lived with him, she said. Moving on, this article posted March 21, 2011 at 3.57 a.m. Headline, Cop Shooter's Mom Says She Begged Him to Surrender. Important Points they say Cruxon shot and killed himself and that SWAT officers found his body after entering the home six hours into the standoff. The gunman, Cruxon, was found dead at the scene, apparently of a self-inflicted gunshot. The city mourns the loss of Officer Craig Burkholt, said Fond du Lac City Manager Tom Hare. Barthuli, in a press conference at the city, the city County Government Center, said it was tearing him apart to be announcing an officer's death as well as other critical injuries. The city mourns the loss of Officer Craig Burkholt, said Fond du Lac City Manager Tom Harry. Craig exemplifies what makes us proud as citizens of Fond du Lac and as Americans. 
His adult life was dedicated to serving others, first with more than five years in the armed forces, including duty in Iraq and Afghanistan, and now by service to our city. Harry continued, when the final story of this day is told, there will be many heroes. Fond du Lac's men and women in uniform did the right thing, unflinchingly, and in the face of inherent danger. A detective called Fond du Lac County District Attorney Dan Kaminsky Sunday morning, informing him of the emergency. The main concern was the perpetrator, Kaminsky said about early issues at the scene. With a gunman who is deceased, there is no issue there anymore. Well... It says the main concern was the perpetrator. If the main concern was the perpetrator with someone in the house who's basically, you know, looked at as a hostage, and your main concern is the perpetrator, uh, your priorities seem to be a bit ass backwards there, sir. The main concern should be getting the hostage out alive. Then, the perpetrator. I also find it uh, interesting to note that it was said with a gunman who's deceased there is no issue there anymore the investigation has now been turned over to the department of justice division of criminal investigations the officer shootings have been difficult for all in law enforcement it's a very very sad event kaminsky said he was a young officer and anybody that knew him he was just one of those guys who was very gentle with people he was not a heavy-handed person Kaminsky said he recalled Burkholz testifying at a court hearing and would see him occasionally in court hallways. He had that reputation of being a nice guy, he added. It's just a shame. Fond du Lac County Sheriff Mick Fink said Sunday night that he hadn't had the time to sort through his feelings of losing a fellow officer. Fink said the sheriff's department was asked to get the officer and others injured out of the home. Sheriff's officers were handling the city's police calls Sunday night and expected to continue to do so for some time. North Fond du Lac Police Department officers also assisted with the incident. Fond du Lac City Councilman Rob Van de Zand, who attended both press conferences Sunday, said he felt he needed to be present. Councilman James Sable said he predicted that the events on Sunday would be on their minds for a long time. When they go to a call now, it's going to be different than it's been in the past, he said. Sable went to the police station Sunday to offer support to members of the department and Chief Barthuli. He said the mood was very somber and evoked feelings that are hard to describe. Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker issued the following statement Sunday night. Wisconsin's thoughts and prayers go out to the family and friends of Officer Craig Burkholz. He made the ultimate sacrifice, laying down his life while serving his community. While we may not have the words to comfort his loved ones, we assure them that Officer Burkholz's state and community are eternally grateful for his heroic service. We also pray for the recovery of his colleagues, Officers Ryan Williams and Zachary Schultz, who were injured in the line of duty. Next headline, this article posted March 21, 2011, 3.57 a.m. Fond du Lac shooter had given up hope, his mother says. Im Important points. All Jimmy Cruxon wanted was a perfect life, but he threw that away Sunday morning when something inside him snapped and he took the life of a Fond du Lac Police Department officer, critically injured another, and then turned the gun on himself. Cruxon opened fire on police Sunday morning when they responded to his home for a sexual assault complaint. Cruxon's mother, Lynn Sarita of Fond du Lac, was contacted by relatives early Sunday morning who reported her son had been involved in a domestic dispute with his girlfriend and that two police officers responding to the incident had been shot. With her heart in her throat and prayers on her lips, Sarita, who had been vacationing in Arizona, quickly made plans to return to Wisconsin. She was able to make contact with her son by cell phone while he was holed up inside his house during the standoff with police. Cruxon's best friend, Joel Foster, was also in constant contact with his childhood friend. We were trying to talk him into putting the gun down and coming out. I felt like we were doing a good job keeping him hanging in there until police cut off our phone contact with him, Foster said. As she was racing homeward, Sarita tried to maintain a glimmer of hope. A friend had called and said they had heard that Jimmy had walked out with police. 
we had hoped that we could just deal with what all had happened and that he had post-traumatic stress syndrome and was just in a mess, Sarita said. And then they called and told us he shot himself and was dead. And as you can see by my highlighted areas here, there are many pieces of this article that have just been copied and pasted in, it would seem, from earlier articles. However, there is some new information, moving downward slightly. Foster said that Foster said the family is distraught over rumors that Cruxon had planned the attack in advance and had bragged about shooting people the next morning. There's rumors out there that he had lined his room with steel and he had all these weapons up there. That's not true, Foster said. We were with him until late Saturday working on his house. It just seems unlikely that Jim would go to the bar by himself. But the shooting that happened seemed unlikely for Cruxon at the time, too. We don't know what happened after we left. Sarita said her son was a hard worker and would help anyone out in a pinch. Most of all, he was a good father to his nine-year-old son that lived with him. Jimmy always talked to his son, teaching him about everything he did, Sarita said. That little boy is just devastated. Next headline, posted March 21, 2011, 3.57 a.m. Shooter's West Side neighborhood has seen its share of trouble. The following statements made by Sally Stark. The cops are always down here for something or other, Stark said. Nothing surprises me down here. Stark said she grew up in the area around Taylor Park and has gotten to know many of the families, including the family of shooter Jimmy Cruxon, who ran West Side Lanes for many years. Jimmy was a nice guy, Stark said. I never would have thought anything like this would have happened. A lot of those rental properties have changed to homeowners, so it's not as bad, Stark said. But the first three years we were back, it was really ugly. Tired of drug dealers in her neighborhood and constant vandalism to her Mary's Avenue property, Judy Krug had enough and left the city. Tired of drug dealers in her neighborhood and constant vandalism to her Mary's Avenue property, Judy Krug had enough and left the city. We would complain to the landlords of the properties and nothing ever got done, Krug said. We had the SWAT team in our neighborhood twice in one year and we decided enough was enough. Using a police scanner application on her smartphone, Evie Rivera kept close watch on the situation unfolding Sunday morning just down the street from her Forest Avenue apartment. I heard gunshots this morning and opened up my window to hear a woman screaming, Rivera said. Although she was concerned about the situation, Rivera has no intention of moving. I was told this was a safe place to live, Rivera said with a laugh, but I'm used to it since I grew up in Chicago. While he no longer lives on the west side, Gary Higgins remembers it as being a safer place 20 years ago. You could sleep on your front porch back then and not worry about getting shot, Higgins said. Shauna Bradford thinks outside influences have been infiltrating the neighborhoods along the Fond du Lac, uh, along the Fond du Lac River during the past few years, making them more unsafe. My boyfriend nearly got shot during the drive-by shooting outside the El Dorado Apartments in 2008, Bradford said. We have a lot of people coming up here from Milwaukee and Chicago areas bringing their bad habits from the big cities. Although he's lived on South Lincoln Avenue for many years, Travis Augustine was unprepared for the sight that met his eyes Sunday morning. Augustine says the sounds of his next-door neighbor Jimmy Cruxon and his live-in girlfriend arguing awakened his young daughter. Minutes later, gunshots rang out causing him to run outside. That's when I saw the officer walking across the parking lot of the D&D &D get shot, Augustine said. I went back inside and armed myself to do whatever I had to do to protect my family. While Augustine said the presence of police officers at Cruxon's home in the past for domestic incidents wasn't surprising, he was stunned by the outcome Sunday morning. I've known Jimmy my whole life and was totally shocked. I never ever thought he would shoot a cop. Augustine said. Onlooker Sarah Sullivan said she and her boyfriend had been looking at a nearby property just the other day. I was more worried about the property being in the flood zone until this morning, Sullivan said. Maybe the guy just snapped and this is an isolated incident, but from what I'm hearing from the other people about the crime in this area it makes me think twice. Stark said domestic incidents and crime are not specific just to the west side of Fond du Lac. Rich people have the same problems just like us poor Westsiders have problems, she said. You just don't hear about it as much. Next article, posted March 21st, 2011, 3.57 a.m. Headline, City Mourns Loss of Young Fond du Lac Officer. Important points. 
The gunman Cruxon was found dead at the scene, apparently of a self-inflicted gunshot. The city mourns the loss of Officer Craig Burkholt, said Fond du Lac City Manager Tom Hare. Craig exemplifies what makes us proud as citizens of Fond du Lac and as Americans. See, here we go. Again, this information seems to be a copy-paste from previous articles. This continues to promote the idea that Officer Burkholtz is absolutely a hero. Next article, posted March 21, 2011, at 3.49 p.m. Headline, Canine shot in Sunday's officer slang is in critical condition. A canine shot during Sunday's fatal officer shooting in Fond du Lac is in intensive care following emergency surgery at an Appleton Animal Hospital. Grendel was in critical condition Monday at Fox Valley Animal Referral Center, a veterinarian said. The German Shepherd was shot when Jimmy Cruxon, 30, opened fire on officers from his 24 South Lincoln Ave residence Sunday morning. Officer Craig Burkholz was shot and killed at the scene, and Officer Ryan Williams, Grendel's handler, was shot and remains in critical condition at Anina Hospital. Grendel was transported to Fox Valley Animal Referral Center in Appleton, where he underwent surgery for abdominal and chest trauma, a spokeswoman said. Now, this article basically goes on and continues to talk about the dog, and then we see down here, animal lovers near and far are rallying for Grendel. When Layla Gitter and Chris Lang found out that one of their clients was hurt, they knew they had to act. The woman set up a donation jar at their pet grooming business. Money will help offset Grendel's medical bills, Gitter said. Gitter told the reporter that Fond du Lac Police Department canines Grendel and Paco are brought in a few times a year for grooming. He's the kind of dog Ryan didn't have to stay with, she said. He's a really cool canine. We're praying for him. No offense to the dog in this situation, but this seems to be a lot of irrelevant information, and this piece just appears to be out there to pull on the heartstrings of animal lovers. Moving on, posted March 21st, 2011 at 9.36 p.m. Headline, as bullets flew, two Fond du Lac police officers were trapped in gunman's house. As police kept a gunman pinned on the second floor of a west side home Sunday during a nearly six hour standoff, two officers were stuck on the first floor with the gunman's sister, unable to leave because of the gunfire. By the time the standoff ended with the suicide of gunman James Cruxon, one police officer lied dead and another had been wounded and dragged to safety by a lieutenant. As family, friends, and the community mourn the death of Fond du Lac officer Craig Burkholz and hope for a recovery of officer Ryan Williams, police released more details of the chaos that erupted when officers arrived at Cruxon's South Lincoln Avenue home to investigate a report he had sexually assaulted his girlfriend. Fond du Lac Police Captain John Gutzman, Officer Becky Coleman, and Williams had arrived about 6.30 a.m. when Cruxon opened fire from his home. Why did it take a day and a half to find out what officers arrived first? Question number eight. One bullet from Cruxon's high-powered rifle ripped into Williams' left shoulder, piercing a strap on his bullet-resistant vest, and another slammed into his upper right chest. Its lethal force dissipated by the vest. Williams eventually was pulled to safety by Lieutenant Jason Laredon. Now, how is it that Officer Williams got hit in his upper right chest and he was perfectly fine? The lethal force was dissipated by the vest. However, allegedly Officer Burkholz was shot in the upper chest in an area not protected by the vest. Well... How can the vest protect William's upper chest, but not Burkholz's upper chest? That makes no sense. Question number nine. Later, as Burkholz responded to the call of gunshots, he was struck in the upper chest in a spot not covered by his bullet-resistant vest and died at the scene from his wound. As the gunfire continued, Fond du Lac police called the Fond du Lac County Sheriff's Department to ask for help from its SWAT team. After the SWAT team arrived, Members focused on rescuing Burkholz, and four deputies were eventually able to reach him and remove him from the scene with an armored vehicle. Our first priority was getting Burkholz to the ambulance, Sheriff Mick Fink said. We had eyes on Burkholz from the entire time I was there. Now that doesn't make sense. Earlier we were told that the first priority was the perpetrator, 
Now we're being told the first priority was getting Burkholz to the ambulance. So which was it? And again, I would think your first priority should be the hostage. Officer's attention then turned to getting Cruxon's sister and the police officers out of the home. So in other words, it was more important to rescue the officer than the citizen. Gutsman and Coleman were able to take up tactical positions within the residence, said Fond du Lac Police Captain Steve Klein. At that point, with the amount of gunfire, they weren't able to safely exit the residence. He said police think Cruxon knew the officers were in the residence. Gutsman did a good job keeping themselves in a safe tactical position and keeping him, Cruxon, away from them, Klein said. Being a former SWAT commander himself, Gutsman ta Gutsman's tactics are very sound. He was a good resource for the Sheriff's Department. After launching tear gas into the home, Gutsman accompanied Sheriff's SWAT team members into the home, where they found Cruxon dead about noon, said Fink. Uniforms had no color Sunday, Fink said, referring to the teamwork among police and sheriff's officers that took place during the standoff with Cruxon. Here we come to the next article posted March 22, 2011, 3.57 a.m. Headline, Officers Were Trapped in Fond du Lac Shooter's Basement. New headline with the same article as two previous. Match the article text. And here again, next, we have uh, posted March 22nd, 2011 at 3.57 a.m. as well, another article with a different headline, two Fond du Lac police officers were trapped inside Shooter's home. Same article, again, why? To make you bored and frustrated and make you stop having interest to follow the story. Moving on to the next article, posted March 22, 2011, at 3.57 a.m. Headline, Injured Fond du Lac Officer Still in Critical Condition. Fond du Lac Police Department Officer Ryan Williams used all his strength Sunday to try to find out if his fellow officers involved in a shootout in Fond du Lac Sunday morning were safe. James M. Cruxon, 30, of 24 South Lincoln Ave, shot Williams, 33, twice at 6.30 a.m. Sunday before taking the life of Officer Craig Burkholz. It's important to note that this indicates that Williams was shot before Craig Burkholz was shot. Williams was shot once in the left shoulder and once in the right chest, just below the collarbone, said Dr. Raymond Jorgen, medical director of trauma at Theta Clark Medical Center in Nina. He was listed in critical condition at 4.30 p.m. Monday, according to a hospital spokesperson. He's just a rock. He's exceeding expectations for recovery. Fond du Lac Police Department Deputy Chief Kevin Lemke said of the canine officer. While Williams cannot speak because he is on a ventilator, he is able to communicate through writing. Captain Steve Klein visited Williams Sunday. The nurse, she said, was working with Ryan and trying to put him in a medically induced coma, Klein said. He kept on trying to fight that. He was trying to talk by writing things down. The first question he wrote out was, how is everybody else doing? When we were able to visit, he opened his eyes, looked at us, put his hand up, and we were able to grab a hold of his hand, said a glassy-eyed Klein. And again, here, no offense to Mr. Williams. It's a tragedy that he was shot. I hope he has a speedy and full recovery. However, these details are not important to the situation. Why are we being given these details as opposed to more real details as to what exactly caused the situation to happen? Next article posted March 22, 2011 at 3.57 a.m. Headline, Fond du Lac Police Officers Struggle to Cope with Fellow Officers' Death. As a squad car draped with a black ribbon set empty below flags flying at half-staff at the Fond du Lac Police Department, officers inside struggled to make sense of Patrolman Craig Burkholz's untimely death. Police Chief Tony Barthuli said staff met with members of the law enforcement death response team all day Monday to undergo critical incident stress debriefing sessions. The sessions are designed to help officers cope with a shootout that occurred early Sunday morning on the city's west side that left Burkholz dead and another officer, Ryan Williams, critically injured. Debriefing is a way to try to start the healing process, said Joe Collins, coordinator of LEDR. It's not the end all to fix everyone. But when you're going through the grieving process, you have to start the healing. 
Collins said sessions were held for everyone from dispatchers to those in close proximity to the situation. Everyone has a different level of need, but they are all part of a family that has lost someone, Collins said. Captain Steve Klein said that third shift officers were dispatched to 24 South Lincoln Ave a little more than an hour before shift change for a report of an assault. Shortly after officers arrived, a gunman inside the home, James Cruxen, opened fire, injuring Officer Ryan Williams. His canine Grendel was struck by a bullet as it sat inside the canine patrol car. Officer Burkholz heard there was an officer down, and he ran towards the gunfire trying to assist, Klein said. Burkholz was shot in the chest by Cruxen and fell in the parking lot of the D&D Tavern across the street. Barthuli said it was the hardest things to see the officer lying motionless. As shots continued to ring out. Here's a question. If Officer Burkholz was across the street from the house in the parking lot of the D&D Tavern when he got shot, why in previous articles does it say that SWAT was eventually able to reach him and remove him from the scene with an armored vehicle. An open parking lot rescue with an armored vehicle should be fairly simple for a trained tactical team. Are the two wounded officers' positions being reversed for the sake of the official story? It was the most helpless feeling in the world, Barthuli said. It took a lot of discipline for every police officer to hold their position until the process of a tactical plan unfolded. As officers did their jobs in this life-and-death situation, spouses, parents, and significant others huddled around police scanners and Facebook sites, desperate to hear news about their loved ones. Many of them flocked to the police department after receiving calls from the department spouses association. I was able to brief them and keep them informed as to what was going on, Barthuli said. The police chief, along with Deputy Chief Kevin Lemke and City Manager Tom Harry, had the unenviable task of notifying Burkholz's wife, Ashley of her husband's death. We have an officer serving as a liaison between her and the department that has been with her nonstop, Barthuli said. Question number 10. Why are we just now finding out that Officer Burkholz has a wife? We found out two days ago that Officer Williams has a wife and two children. Why did it take this long to mention the wife of Officer Burkholz? Also impacted by the day's events were children of police officers. Many of the officers said their children refused to go to bed until mom or dad walked through the door, Barthuli said. Members of the police chaplain program also assisted staff and families during the crisis. Deputies from the Fond du Lac County Sheriff's Department responded to city calls on Monday, allowing city police time to process and cope with the event. There were a lot of officers involved in this, and we want to make sure that before we put them out on the road that they're ready psychologically and emotionally, Barthuli said. We have a very young department, and some people handle it differently. Some people want to go out right away and hit the bricks, while others aren't sure. Klein said that staff will be keeping a close eye on officers watching for signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. Before anyone had a grasp on PTSD, officers were sent back out onto the road and not a lot of thought was given to their mental well-being, especially after a critical incident like this, Klein said. We're also taking into consideration doubling up officers for a period of time just so they have someone there to talk to, if nothing else. Klein said Officer Williams continued to make progress Monday communicating with officers from his hospital bed at Theta Clark Medical Center using a dry erase board. One of the first questions he asked was if everyone else was all right, Klein said. Throughout the day on Monday, Klein said the department was deluged with donations of food emails from law enforcement officers across the state and retired police veterans stopping in to lend support. One unique thing about law enforcement is that it's a brotherhood, Klein said. Anyone who wears the badge is going to be there for their fellow officers during these tragic situations. In the end, Barthuli expects his department to rise above the tragedy. They've just seen an officer go through the ultimate sacrifice, Barthuli said. It's been heart-wrenching, and it's pulled our team even closer together. Next article, posted March 22, 2011, at 3.57 a.m., again... Fond du Lac Police Tried to Cope with Officer's Death, which is a different headline. Same article, for the third time. Are you serious? As a matter of fact, this might even be more than the third time, come to think of it. 
All right, next article posted March 22, 2011, 6.59 a.m. Headline, Details from Fond du Lac Officer Shootings Emerge. In the face of unspeakable tragedy, heroes arose Sunday morning on Fond du Lac's west side. Again, the mention of the police's heroes. Uniforms had no color Sunday, said Fond du Lac County Sheriff Mick Fink, referring to the teamwork that took place during a six-hour standoff with James M. Cruxon, 30, at 24 South Lincoln Ave. Cruxon opened fire on officers at 6.30 a.m. from a room inside his home. He was found dead in the home shortly before noon. Fond du Lac Police Department Captain John Gutzman, Officer Ryan Williams, and Officer Becky Coleman arrived at the scene to investigate an alleged sexual assault involving Cruxon and his girlfriend. Fond du Lac Police Captain Steve Klein said there were concerns about a six-year-old girl reported to be in the home. The girl was later located at a nearby residence. Williams was outside the residence when he was shot with a high-powered rifle, said Klein. Coleman and Gutsman had to stay inside the home with Cruxon's sister as bullets began to fly, said Klein. Again, they refer to the woman as Cruxon's sister. Williams was shot once in the left shoulder and once in the right chest, just below the collarbone, according to Dr. Raymond Jorgen, Medical Director of Trauma at Theta Clark Medical Center in Nino. Fond du Lac Police Lieutenant Jason Laridan helped pull Williams to safety after he was shot, Klein said. Fond du Lac Police Officer Craig Burkholz responded to the scene after he heard the report of shots fired. Burkholz was struck in his upper chest in an area not covered by a bulletproof vest and died at the scene. Again... That makes no sense. It doesn't make sense that Williams was hit in his upper chest and Burkholz was also hit in his upper chest and Burkholz somehow is hit in an area not covered by a bulletproof vest. We've seen the photos. Bulletproof vests cover the upper chest. That makes no sense. Klein and David Spakowitz of the Department of Criminal Investigation declined to go into detail about the shootings or preliminary findings. Question number 11. Why can the public not have the details? Why so few answers as to how and why this all happened? Unfortunately, while he, Burkholz, was responding to assist his fellow officers, he was struck with a fatal round, Klein said. I can't tell you how difficult that is for fellow officers on the scene. At 6.40 a.m., Captain Dan Will of the Fond du Lac County Sheriff's Department contacted Sheriff Fink about the shooting and the request for the SWAT team's armored vehicle. Fink arrived at Lincoln Avenue as gunfire erupted again. He met with Fond du Lac Police Chief Tony Barthuli and Deputy Chief Kevin Lemke. Fink then took over as tactical leader of SWAT team members at the scene as Barthuli dealt with families of the wounded officers. Laridane told Fink that Williams was removed from the scene. Our first priority was getting Burkholz to the ambulance, Fink said. We had eyes on Burkholz the whole time I was there. Again, shouldn't the first priority be getting the hostage out of the situation? Four deputies retrieved Burkholz. I watched Burkholz very closely for any movement from the time I got there to the time we could get close enough to get him, Fink said. Fond du Lac Police Lieutenant Aaron Goldstein was with Burkholz in the ambulance. Officers' attention then turned to getting Cruxon's sister and the police officers out of the home. Again, backwards priorities. Get the hostage out first. Gutsman and Coleman were able to take up tactical positions within the residence, said Klein, who added the two had handguns and at least one had long gun. At that point, with the amount of gunfire, they weren't able to safely exit the residence. He said police believe Cruxon knew the officers were in the residence. Gutsman did a good job keeping themselves in a safe, tactical position and keeping him, Cruxon, away from them, Klein added. Sheriff SWAT team members drove an armored vehicle close to the home for the dramatic rescue. As they drove away, Gutsman fired toward the house. Fink asked Gutsman to stay at the scene since he was familiar with the layout of the inside of the house. He wanted to stay, Fink recalled. I would stand and fight with John Gutsman any day. First they say Gutsman fired shots as the vehicle he was in drove away. Then in the next sentence it says he was asked to stay at the scene. Did he stay at the scene or did he drive away firing? Question 12. Klein added, being a former SWAT commander himself, Gutsman's tactics are very sound. He was a good resource for the Sheriff's Department. 
After launching tear gas into the home, Gutsman accompanied Sheriff Department SWAT team members into the home where they found Cruxon dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, said Fink. Next article posted March 22, 2011, 3.57 a.m. Headline, Rampage Defies Explanation. The shocking events that took place over a six-hour period early Sunday morning on Fond du Lac's west side defy logical explanation. The events don't defy logical explanation. The events make perfect sense if you have the whole story. We know the basics. James Cruxon, a 30-year-old Army veteran who spent time in Iraq, shot in the chest and killed Fond du Lac officer Craig Burkholz. Cruxon's fusillade of shots while holed up in his home also critically injured 33-year-old officer Ryan Williams, a nine-year veteran of the force who was shot twice in the chest. Cruxon killed himself inside the home where he lived with his girlfriend and two children. As is often the case when a chaotic rampage occurs, we are left to puzzle over the most basic of questions. Why? The only certain answers in this situation likely died with Cruxon. You'll find out why this is a direct lie soon enough. His parents and friends speculate that a combination of post-traumatic stress disorder and Cruxon's erratic relationship with his girlfriend were contributing factors in the melee. Some are speculating that the shootings were retribution for an affair she was allegedly having with a Fond du Lac officer. Definitive answers may be difficult, if not impossible, to obtain. They likely would provide little solace to the loved ones who mourn the death of Burkholz, who was only 28 and a two-year member of the Fond du Lac police force. This is cryptic information. You'll find out why soon as well. Their only certainty is a sense of deep loss and grief. We pray that they find comfort during the days and weeks ahead. We also must remember that Cruxon's family and friends are hurting deeply and will need plenty of support and prayers as well. We hope for a full and speedy recovery for Williams, who is in critical condition at Theta Clark Medical Center in Nina. His survival would emerge the only ray of sunshine on an otherwise very dreary day. All right, next article out of the Fond du Lac Reporter. Headline, Fond du Lac Shooter Head Past Battery Charge. This posted March 22nd, 2011, 4.41 p.m. The relationship family and friends say pushed James M. Cruxon to shoot two Fond du Lac police officers as flared up in the past, according to court documents. Officers responded to Cruxon's home, 24 South Lincoln Ave, Sunday morning to investigate a woman's report about an alleged sexual assault and to perform a welfare check on the woman's six-year-old daughter, said Fond du Lac Police Department Deputy Chief Kevin Lemke. Cruxon opened fire on officers, critically injuring Ryan Williams and killing Craig Burkholz. The shooter later that morning took his life. At 3.35 a.m. on September 7, 2009, three officers responded to Cruxon's South Lincoln Avenue home for a report of a domestic disturbance, according to the criminal complaint. A woman, the same woman who filed a sexual assault complaint over the weekend, told police she was upset that Cruxon was flirting with and touching another woman while they were visiting a number of taverns. Question 13. If this sexual assault complaint was filed over the weekend, why would officers show up at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning to investigate? This makes no sense at all. I do understand that Sunday is still the weekend. However, by phrasing it as such, a woman the same woman who filed the sexual assault complaint over the weekend told police she was upset that Cruxon was flirting with and touching another woman while they were visiting a number of taverns. This article makes it sound as if the woman filed a complaint over the weekend and then oddly later at about 6 a.m. the officers went to investigate that complaint. It certainly doesn't make it sound like the woman filed a complaint the officers immediately went to investigate and then the situation ensued. Doesn't sound like that at all. The woman said every time she confronted Cruxon about issues in the past, he became angry and violent, according to the complaint. The woman said Cruxon grabbed her hair while he was driving a car. She took out a pocket knife and stabbed Cruxon in the forearm, according to the complaint. On October 13, 2009, Cruxon was ordered to serve one year on probation on one count of battery. 
A charge of resisting or obstructing an officer was dismissed and read into the court record. The Fond du Lac Police Department is handling the investigation into the sex assault allegation, while the State Division of Criminal Investigation is handling the ensuing gunfight. We owe it to the victim and the community to conduct a thorough investigation, Fond du Lac Police Department Captain Steve Klein said of the sex assault allegation. Just because the alleged perpetrator is deceased, we still need to be able to do a thorough investigation and answer that question. On Monday, Klein said there is nothing to indicate the woman's report was false. The woman did not return a call from the reporter on Sunday. She did not answer her phone, and her voicemail was full on Monday. Her cell phone number changed Tuesday. What is this woman's name? Why is she so reluctant to speak with the media? Note the cell phone info at the right. Keep in mind that this woman, whoever she is, did not return a call from the reporter on Sunday. She did not answer her phone, and her voicemail was full on Monday. Her cell phone number changed Tuesday. Also remember that Cruxon's sister was allegedly inside the house. Why do we not still have a single statement from Cruxon's sister? We don't have any statements by anybody else about her saying anything. And Cruxon's sister, if she was there in the home, wouldn't her account of this situation be of paramount importance? Yes, it would. So we have Cruxon's alleged sister not saying a word. And mysteriously, we have this woman who is said to be Cruxon's ex-girlfriend who they will not print her name. She hasn't said a word to the media either. What is going on with these two women? Or is it really just one woman? And now we will take a look at some articles by a couple different sources. This article from ABC News, which is WBAY TV2, Headline, Police Piece Together, Events of Sunday's Shootout. Updated March 22nd, 2011, at 6.21 p.m. Now again, the headline, Police Piece Together, Events of Sunday's Shootout. Well, you read the actual article, and I must say, uh, piece together details? What details? There are zero new details of relevance in this article. Nothing new in relevance. See for yourself. And next, we're on to WFRV Green Bay, Northeast Wisconsin News. Residents mourn Officer Burkholz as investigation begins. Posted March 21st, 2011. No new real relevant information here either, but there is something of note. Near the crime scene, many are still in shock. One neighbor said she could hear gunshots all morning yesterday. Today was the first day she was able to leave her house. Julie Strait's home is just a few feet away from where James Cruxon opened fire. Strait says she feared for her life. He fired, then they would fire another round back, and he'd fire, Strait said. It was kind of a back-and-forth thing. The investigation is now in the hands of state investigators from the Wisconsin Department of Justice Criminal Investigations. Crews say it's possible they'll be back out again tomorrow. What is interesting of note particularly about what I just read is... Near the crime scene, many are still in shock. Neighbor said she could hear gunshots all morning. Today was the first day she was able to leave her house. Everything is a bunch of fear, and although those things may be true, it's very clear that in this situation, just like many other situations where there's some sort of cover-up going on, the police department and the media play up the fear factor of the event. Because when an event is traumatizing, people are far less likely to ask questions. This is where things get really interesting. Let's take a look at some more Facebook comments and profiles. Let's begin with these comments on Facebook. Josie's daughter got out this morning. She was not hurt, thank God. And she says, Jim, I believe, was in the service. 
Tanya asks, who is Josie? Was that his kid too? And yes, thank God, Lisa, it's a sad situation. All around glad your brother is safe. But my heart goes out to families involved, whomever they are. Josie is the girl, says he. His ex-girlfriend, it was her house. No, it is not his daughter, but he does have kids. Now, you can tell by what he's saying here that she clearly knows some of these people in this situation, um, or at least knows people who know them. So when I read these comments, I, uh, I understood that she knew a bit of what was going on. And even more so when I read the following comment, she apparently was currently dating an officer, not sure who, I don't like to say too much, you know how rumors are already flying, and for all the families involved, it is already hard enough, so not going to voice myself too much, I just hope everyone is okay. Clearly at this point, he knows a little bit more at least than she's letting on. These posts right here tell us directly that the woman involved her name was Josie. Josie is Jim Cruxon's ex-girlfriend. That it was her house. That it's not his daughter, but he does have kids. And that Josie is apparently currently dating an officer. So it says right there that Josie is Jim's ex-girlfriend and is currently dating an officer. And that information directly contradicts what the police are giving us and what the media is giving us, saying that the woman in the house was Cruxon's sister. They're not saying anything about it being his ex-girlfriend or live-in girlfriend. What they are telling us is that the live-in girlfriend went to the police station to make a report of a sexual assault. And right now you may be asking, how does Brandy know these things? Does Brandy know Jim? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. As a matter of fact, she did know Jim. So I figured, hey, Brandy's the right person to start talking to. And that's when I made my Facebook post that I presented earlier in the broadcast. When I made that post, Brandy responded by saying, I couldn't agree with you more, Mark. I do not want to comment much on the subject because that's how rumors start. But we all do know that an officer was involved with the woman, so I'm sure the police don't want to comment much due to that fact. I'm sure they won't tell us everything, but hopefully the woman involved will shed some light on what led to this happening. It is sad that now the shooter is dead and we will never hear his side. Not saying his side is justified, but who really knows? All of the previous comments were made on Sunday the 20th, the day of the incident. Pretty much everybody on Sunday was waiting until 4 p.m. for the press conference. Once 4 p.m. rolled around, I was glued to the TV, as were most other people. This is what the press conference had to say. Prepared to give you now. I apologize for forcing the press, but I could not give you the information that we're prepared to give you now. We had a dynamic situation going uh, with the Sheriff's Department, Wisconsin State Patrol, and our department with our tactical teams. Uh, we were still in the middle of a deployment. So at this time, Deputy Chief Lemke will uh, give a prepared. Um, or he is the PIO on this and will give a prepared release, but um, we have District Attorney Dan Kaminsky, Sheriff Nickton, Deputy Chief Kevin Lemke, City Manager Tom Harry, Ed Wall, the Administrator of the Criminal, our Division of Criminal Investigation for the State of Wisconsin, and our Fire Chief Pete O'Leary. Um, I just would like, before uh, Deputy Chief does his prepared response, I spoke with the um, officers, um, parents that were involved today, and I guess they were truly sad that we lost an officer. It was my biggest nightmare, and I think it's the biggest nightmare of any police officer or any parent or family member of a police officer to have to give this press release. The officer that we're going to speak about today, I think, and he went through the two years. And he was a quality individual. He stood for all the right things. He was a, as Kevin will say, our deputy chief will say, but talking off 
Craig was an outstanding officer and a good person. And we're going to miss him. See that here? This is a indeed a difficult day for the city of Fond du Lac. It, it's also a day where we acknowledge that people who are charged to protect the citizens of the city of Fond du Lac did their job. So it is also a day of hope. I had the privilege of knowing the officers. The, uh, we are well served by the service of our police department. I think when the final details of what happened today become final and you, and you hear of them, which will most likely take a while in the investigation, you find that there were many heroes. At this time, I uh, introduced Deputy Chief Kevin Lemke, and uh, he will give you more details as to what, what occurred today. Thank you. Good afternoon. This morning, Fond du Lac police officers were continuing their investigation into a sexual assault, which occurred at 24 South Lincoln Avenue. Shortly after their arrival, at about 6.30 a.m. this morning, they were fired upon by a large caliber weapon. Two officers of the Fond du Lac Police Department and a canine unit were struck. Officer Craig Burkholz, I'll spell that B-I-R-K-H-O-L-Z. Craig was 28 years old, died as a result of injuries he sustained at the scene. Officer Burkholz is survived by his wife, Ashley. Officer Burkholz is also survived by his parents, and a brother. Officer Ryan Williams was also injured and received gun, gunshot wounds in this incident. He was removed from the scene and transported by med flight to a Fox Valley Hospital where he's undergone surgery and is expected to recover. His canine partner, Brundle, was also struck and is currently undergoing surgery at this time in the Fox Valley. Officer Zach Schultz received minor injuries at the scene. He was treated and released. We had a total of seven police squad cars, two ambulances that received fire, some of which were occupied by officers and ambulance personnel. It is our understanding that the suspect, who is 30-year-old James Cruxon, spelled C-R-U-C-K-S-O-N, died at the scene of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. The suspect has had many prior contacts with the Fond du Lac Police Department, including criminal arrests. Our main concern, one of our main concerns at the scene this morning when officers arrived was to check the welfare of a six-year-old girl that we believed was in the residence at the time with the suspect. She was later discovered at a residence nearby and she was fine. Again, we truly appreciate, we're appreciative of the ongoing support of our community during this critical time. Special thanks goes out to the Wisconsin Law Enforcement Death Response Team, who has come to our department to assist us in this time of grief and also to assist the family. We also want to especially thank the Fond du Lac County Sheriff's Department for their immediate assistance, also Wisconsin State Patrol and North Fond du Lac Police Department and of course the Fond du Lac Fire Department. All, all officers were in harm's way at one time or another. The investigation is ongoing. It is a, now a criminal investigation, and this investigation has been turned over to the Wisconsin Department of Justice Division of Criminal Investigations. So therefore, the Fond du Lac Police Department is not going to be able to release details of that investigation. Presently, the Department of Justice has 22 agents that are conducting this investigation. And any further questions about the investigation can be directed to Bill Koch at DOJ headquarters. His number is 608-266-6686. Uh, again, I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to answer a lot of questions, but if there are some, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Your office just went in at some point, we've seen it on video, take a woman out of his house. Um, I don't know if you talk about who that woman was, what the situation was there. Yeah, I, I don't have her name, but there, there was a woman also inside the residence that we did assist. We understand that's his sister. 
the, the gunman's sister. Is that correct? That's not the victim in the case? That was not the victim. Is that his sister? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. We'll have to wait until I get confirmation on that. We're not, we're not looking for a name, but can you, like, can you give us more information about the sexual assault case that you guys were investigating that led to all this? Yeah, yeah the, the original uh, call uh, was of a uh, woman that came to the Fond du Lac Police Department to report a sexual assault. Um, the officers were investigating that sexual assault. The, uh, uh, the, the gunman, the suspect, was the suspect in the sexual assault. And again, we were concerned about a six-year-old girl that was supposed to be at the residence. Can yes, sir. Do you have any information why Preston allegedly started shooting? I, I, again, I, I don't. Um, this will be part of what the Department of uh, Division of Criminal Investigation, they'll try to determine, for, determine that for us. What type of weapons did he have? Again, it appeared to be a, uh, some type of uh, rifle, but I don't have the specifics on what make or model. Can you tell us where, where the, the officer uh, Greg, first? Yeah. The officer arrived on the scene. Officer Burkholz, he was the first one on the scene, or he? What, what was? It? How did that happen? How was he walking up to the house? Did he? Yeah, that, that, that information is not is not correct, Greg. But um, at, at this point, we want to make sure that we have all the facts first before we release that. So that, that may not be accurate, what you, what you have, as far as uh, who was there first and, and so forth. And, and the, the order. Uh, the, the, the shots, uh, initial shots, uh, um, that I believe was 630. So the, yes. Tell us a little bit more about the injuries of where they were shot and where Officer Burkholz was shot as well. I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Officer Burkholz was shot in the upper upper chest. Upper chest. Um, the other officer was was shot. Um, also, the Officer Williams that, that survived. He was shot twice in the chest. If it wasn't for, I did speak with the surgeon. If it wasn't for his ballistic vest. He, he too probably would have died in the line. Any reason why? I mean, maybe he was shot in his chest. Did he have a vest on? Yes. Both officers had vests, but as you know, a vest only covers a certain part of your body. Do you know if he died instantly? Or I'm not at liberty to. I'm not sure. How, how was Zach Schultz injured? Zach Schultz was one of the responding officers. Um, he was injured in the, on the stairwell. So it was on the stairwell. That's. But he actually, Officer Schultz, like, the city manager said there were a lot of heroes today. Our officers, when this comes out, there were a lot of officers that were heroes. Zach would be one of those officers that actually uh, went way beyond, beyond the call of duty. Chief, you're very emotional. Can you elaborate on your feelings? Well, I'll tell you. I'm uh, 32 years, retiring on June 30th. This is a nightmare to me. I wish someone would poke me and say, okay, Tony, you can wake up. We will deal with this. We've talked to our team today, our department. We have retired officers come in and assist. We've had community members. And just the atmosphere down at the station, I, I spoke, spoke to Craig's parents. They'd be proud of the support and the dedication and the camaraderie that the other officers showed to him. You know, we do a lot of good things on the Fond du Lac Police Department. And today, the city, when we call for help, we have the state there, we have Wisconsin State Patrol there, the sheriff, the DA was hands on, the city manager, Chief O'Leary. I mean, this community is a great community, and it tears me apart have to you see this happen. No, this is the last one was approximately 50 years ago. And we will have, we will. Have a tribute for Officer Booth. Where is he from? Yeah, Kenosha. From Kenosha. He, he sounds like an amazing guy that he served his country for five years, came in. I don't know if you can just elaborate any more about him, about his time in service, you know, I mean. You can see the smile come to my face when you talk about this officer. He was a class officer. When he came from UW Oshkosh, he came in and he was proud. He just wanted to serve. He got done serving his country. He wanted to serve this community. He moved. To this community to be part of this community. As the city manager said, Officer Williams, yesterday they had the canine rest. These guys are all about community. So it tears me apart and the rest of our team to have to, you know, have this conversation. But we'll have it in honor of Officer Burkhoff.
You know, I'm not at liberty. I just, that's going to be part of the criminal investigation. So. Deputy Chief, can you talk a little bit about what progressed after the officers were shot and sort of what your efforts were to make sure to be in the building? You saw the armored truck out there. Can you talk about some of those precautions? Yeah, right now, again, the DCI is investigating all those aspects, and we really need to allow them to take a look at the entire incident, and then they'll put a package together for us. And as soon as we can, you know, we'll release additional details. But right now, we need to let them do their investigation before we release any further information on that. Any information on when funeral services are going to be held at this point? Our friends from the leader group, they're working on all the arrangements with the family. We've had an officer with the family, the deceased officer with Craig's family. I personally, along with the deputy chief and the city manager, made notification to have an officer with the family ever since, and then same with Officer Williams. So, you know, we'll do this together, and I've asked them if we could do something in our community to pay tribute to this fallen officer, and I expect that will happen. And as far as Williams, you know, he's getting out of the hospital? His condition, you know, I don't want to get into it, but, you know, he received two gunshot wounds, so it's going to be a while, I would anticipate. I'm not a medical, but, you know, he suffered a lot of trauma. The suspect, you mentioned that he has been a problem before in the past. Has there been anything like this or close to this before? Have you shown this type of violence before? Yeah, I mean, obviously you can look at CCAP and see what you see there, but he does have a past history with the Fond du Lac Police Department, and, again, as soon as we can, we'll try to release that. Are you aware of any sort of issues with this relationship that was going on? Some people have made allegations that there was an affair going on, that there were some other circumstances that sort of inflamed everyone. We're not going to be able to comment on any of the particulars about the investigation at this time. We understand there's people saying things, but understand we have to put this picture together, and we can't compromise it with rumor and innuendo. We're going to have to do a full aspect of the investigation. But that's it. We're all set. Thank you, everyone. Is there a chance there could be criminal charges filed, or do you believe that you have everyone who could be a suspect? Is there a picture? So what did Andy think about the press conference? Andy said, well, I didn't want to comment, but I'm so pissed right now after that bullshit conference. They didn't even confirm the woman's name, which is Josie, or the fact that there was an affair happening. I like they asked why was Craig the first officer there, or if he was already there, and they couldn't even respond to that. Why? Because he has a wife, Ashley, and God forbid a Fond du Lac cop was having an affair with a model. I am sorry to all, but that is bullshit. Fond du Lac police have been covering their asses for too long, sweeping everything under the rug. Someone needs to do something about this. I have a friend, Johnny Johnson, that has been done so, so wrong. But because he had a background when he was younger, the reporter and police made him seem to the public like a monster. Just sickens me. And by the reporter, she means the Fond du Lac reporter newspaper, by the way. After he made that post and I read it, I messaged her and we started talking a little bit more in depth. This is what transpired and led to the nail in the coffin evidence. And he says, hello, so what would you like to ask me? Hey, I'm just trying to get all this straight and not mix anything up. I hear ya. Craig was first at the scene, seemingly due to being involved with Josie. That's what they just said on the news. Tony, chief of police, said it. I am assuming he was the one involved with her. Why else would he be there alone at 6 a.m. or probably sooner? Someone should find out if that was even his shift. Agreed. All I know is that she was dating with a married officer, which would explain why the police are acting like they don't know anything. May I ask how you know that for sure? My mother knows her and knew about it before any of this happened. We all knew Jim. I know he was at the bar last night telling all kinds of people that she left him for a married cop and he was going to do something about it this morning. I also just spoke with a friend of mine. Her little cousin is Jim's son. And I guess the kid's mom, Jim's ex, also cheated on him with the same officer. Which is probably why he lost it. Same cop, two women in his life. 
her whole family is discussing the fact that it was the same officer. I know a lot of it could be he say, she say, but how do we really get the facts? What gives it away to me is that they won't confirm the woman, won't even give her name. But they have no problem speaking about the little girl, Josie's daughter. I think they're trying to protect the officer's wife and family and themselves. I actually know Jim's ex-wife, Sammy, was best friends with her growing up. Let's give you viewers a proper introduction, and after that we'll dive right into the information. Say hello everybody, meet Josie Warner, a short playboy bunny from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, with an apparent love for all things pink. According to her MySpace page, I'm a little woman with tons to offer. They say good things come in small packages, and that is so true. I'm 5'2 and 94 pounds with tons of fun, loving energy and attitude. I love to be kept busy, and I find, and find myself attracted to people like me. I'm very sexual and come off that way, too. People have told me I remind them of Jessica Rabbit. I love that. I love to model and have been doing so since I was 18. I recently got accepted into Playboy as a live model with other opportunities in Playboy as well. I love dancing and having fun at a club is a must. I am currently going to school. I hope to become famous someday. Ha ha. If you have any questions, just ask. Don't be shy. And who would Josie Warner like to meet? Why, Britney Spears and... God. Now that we know a little bit about Josie, let's take a look at her Facebook page and see what we can possibly turn up there. One very key piece of information her Facebook contained was the following. Josie made a post on her Facebook page that said, I loved you, but now you're gone and I'm in pain. It won't go away. You should have taken me with. Her friend Jackie Garcia responds to Josie's post by saying, that's exactly how I feel about your trip to Florida. And as soon as I saw that, that jogged my memory back to this news clip. It's a bad situation. It was sad all over a woman. His aunt says 30-year-old James Croxon was at wit's end after his live-in girlfriend told him she was seeing another man. She admitted and told my nephew everything when she was down in Florida that she had been cheating on him for a while she admitted and told my nephew everything when she was down in Florida that she had been cheating on him for a while. Josie's Facebook page also contained another gem of information. First, remember this news article? I told you to note the cell phone info earlier in the program. This is why. Looking at the blue underlining, the woman did not return a call from the reporter on Sunday, the reporter being a Fond du Lac newspaper. She did not answer her phone, and her voicemail was full on Monday. Her cell phone number changed Tuesday. Keeping that in mind, take a look at this post that Josie Warner made on her Facebook page. The police has my phone, but I got a new one, so please send me your email so I can get all in touch with you if needed. That post was made Monday morning at 9.51 a.m. That would go to explain why, quote-unquote, the woman did not return a call from the reporter on Sunday. She did not answer her phone, and her voicemail was full on Monday because her phone sat in the police station all day, probably turned off collecting voicemails. And her cell phone number changed Tuesday. Hence Josie posting on Monday, the police has my phone, but I got a new one. If she got a new one Monday, she would have it activated by Tuesday and, of course, would it probably also have her old number canceled by Tuesday. Then we have this posted by Josie Warner. Wish I could talk to him today. This was posted Wednesday, March 23rd at 9.41 a.m. It is clear from the following comments that when Josie Warner says, Wish I could talk to him today, she is referring to the fallen Officer Burkholz. Patricia Ulala replies, You can. He's in your heart. Jackie Garcia replies, you can. T.J. Shenborn replies, are you going to memorial parade or service today? Josie Warner replies, yes, I am going to pay my respects to the officer who was killed. Jamie Now replies, 
Oh, Josie, I cannot even begin to imagine how you're feeling. Stay strong. Now, in a different situation or taken on their own, I can see how these comments, for the most part, seem pretty harmless. However, given all the other information and evidence we've been through already, I think it's very apparent what these comments are referring to specifically. By all indication, Josie Warner is wishing she could talk to Officer Burkholz today due to the relationship she had with him. When Patricia says, you can, he's in your heart, she really does mean that the officer has a place in her heart because there was that relationship there. But with how the media is representing the issue, she can't exactly post that on Facebook now, can she? When TJ says, are you going to Memorial Parade or service today, that's also an indicator that Josie is referring to Officer Burkholz. Otherwise, why would TJ make that question a post under her post of, wish I could talk to him today? Why would TJ not have started a different thread for that question if it wasn't related? When Josie replies, yes, I'm going to pay my respects to the officer who was killed, that just seems like an unnatural statement. It seems wordy and over-informative. Given the question that TJ asked specifically, would a more proper or normal answer simply be yes or yes, I'm going to pay my respects? And when Jamie Nao responds, Aw, Josie, I cannot even begin to imagine how you are feeling. Stay strong. Again, if this was in relation to the event in general, why wouldn't she post that on its own under any of the other numerous threads that are basically in that theme? Rather, she posts it under Josie's comment of, wish I could talk to him today, where the other responses seem to indicate that it is specifically Officer Burkholz that she's speaking of. This is another comment that also implies a relationship between Ms. Warner and Officer Burkholz. In conversation with Bree, I said, I am assuming there are people that want to get the truth about this situation out. Anything you can do to help would be much appreciated. I heard you mention that Fond du Lac often covers things up. Please reply, yes, more often than people realize. And the Fond du Lac reporter is even worse. They will only tell the police side. I have met with Peggy Breister, editor-in-chief, many times about what she prints. I have stormed into her office and tried to get her to reprint or retract some of the things that she has printed. She always goes with the police and won't hear anything else. They did me and my husband so wrong. I didn't even know any of them. On top of that, we were the only wedding in town that night out of more than six weddings that had an African American. The reporter has a website where people can comment and stuff. Printed a bunch of bull about our wedding. That, we had nothing to do with it. I don't care what anyone says. Fond du Lac is racist and it is so horrible. It was a Saturday evening and summer. A bunch of different fights broke out in Fond du Lac, as usual like every other Saturday, and there was three other weddings that day earlier at the same location. The park in the city blamed my wedding for the fights. Not one person involved in the fights even attended my wedding. And I read the most disgusting comments about my husband being black, and the reporter has to approve these comments, and they did. I know of a couple things like this happening. It's a disgrace. Yup, they're going to bury the truth right along with Craig and Jim, but I feel sorry for the female that was involved, because if she doesn't speak the truth, seeming as though only her and the two men she was involved with are the only ones who know the truth, she will have to live her life knowing she helped cover this thing up. Have a conscience, people, and let the truth be told. 